Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. Today, I'm very excited because we have Ashley Pokler here. She is a psychologist, and she has her own podcast on our community, and I suggest that you go to it. It has some great episodes on it, and it teaches you all about different areas of your life and resilience, family, empowering yourself. There's so many topics that she talks about that really hit home to a lot of people in this in this world and families itself. And, you know, make sure you check her podcast out. She's also part of our podcast community. So please, I, I encourage you to send questions and ask her um, any, any questions that come to mind. She's always here and always happy to help anybody. And also don't forget to follow us and like us and subscribe to our podcast. We'd love to have you on board with us and we'd love to send you notifications out to let you know when the next episodes are coming out so you can grow with us as a community and we can grow together and balance our lives in all areas. So Ashley, it is a pleasure to have you back on the show. I'm so excited. You mentioned that you wanted to talk about the power of community today and the importance of it. And I'd love to hear more about that. You know, For anyone that hasn't you know, heard you speak before, maybe you can tell them a little about yourself briefly before we begin. Yeah, so I am a child and adolescent psychologist by way of being a special education teacher for high school kids first. Um, and I have four kids of my own that I homeschool. They're ages 10 to 14. Um, and what I do in the field of psychology um, really looks at systemic change, looks at how do we make the world a better place for particularly children, but everybody. Um, and so I do some education. I'm a teacher, a professor for doctoral and master's level students. Um, and then I work for a nonprofit that uh, addresses child sex trafficking and sexual exploitation through rescues, but also through prevention, through education, and ensuring that those kids and families are connected with appropriate services um, if they were to face traumatic situations. And that's actually kind of where that um, where I've been thinking about uh, communities and how important they are because our organization is currently um, in Western New York or Western North Carolina um, in the Banner Elk area uh, providing services originally just rescue and um, resources, food, water, those kinds of things. But now we're starting to think about how do we support these communities in um, in coming back and healing as a community? Now that they've survived, how do they thrive again? Um, yeah. And that idea of community really was central to those conversations. I love it. You know, nowadays the world, um, you know, has there's so much, you know, going on today. And, you know, a lot of times, like I mentioned, you know, people don't realize that it's so important to bond together as a unity, as a group, you know, to support each other and not go against each other, not be vindictive or hate, you know, show hate or or any type of cruelty towards another human being. You know, in the times of disaster is when you see people come together to help each other. But why do we have to wait till disaster strikes? Why can't we build those powerful communities and have the support and the care from all individuals around where we can, you know, you know, develop friendships and develop, you know, role models and mentors in our life that could help us, you know, as an adult and as a child, you know, I think it's really important that people understand that we are the, the future. So we really have to do our best to, to help each other because everybody makes a difference in this world. And I think people sometimes forget that we kind of, like you had mentioned earlier, we lose track sometimes of what's really important in life. Yeah, we, we get stuck in the day-to-day -day grind. And I think we've discussed this in a previous podcast about how our brains aren't made for the world that we live in today. Um, yeah. And we I think we were talking about it tied to technology, but it's tied to, to how we socialize too. You know, we are pack animals. We're pack creatures. We, we gain um, like love and like, that's the right word, we gain life. Um, and happiness and contentment through interactions with others. And, and the science backs that up. You know, the, the research on um, healthy living and longevity found that the number one indicator of long life and of happiness long life was tied to your social interactions and your social capabilities. 
Um, they did the studies with the monkeys. Um, it was a long time ago, but a, a baby monkey would rather curl up with a soft pretend mom that had no milk than with the wire mom that had milk. So it, it willingly gave up its life for the comfort of feeling like it was with another of its type. And, and, and humans are that way too. That's why we see reactive attachment disorder in kids who are put into orphanages. All yeah. their physical needs are met. They're not wanting for anything physically, but their social emotional needs and their needs for interaction and their needs for love and comfort and attachment aren't met. And it has life last, long lasting, life altering impacts on how their brain develops. And so we're in this world that's constantly, this, 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 you know, my phone's buzzed three times since we started this conversation. It, it's, it's not, it's nonstop. There's always something that needs done. And if we're not really purposeful about making sure that we get those social interactions, we yeah. don't get them. And, and our brain and our body is not made for that. And, and I got to be honest, an online, this online podcast conversation, while it's great, it does not count as building a real community. It has to be that face-to-face -face we're getting and we're receiving and giving to each other. Yes, I think it has a huge impact when you meet people and you physically see people and you physically can shake their hand or give them a hug. It it plays a big role. You know, they, there are many times where I've met people we've connected really well and we developed great friendships, long distance friendships. And but then when we got to meet each other in person, it was just exhilarating. You know, it was just a, a great experience. It's like that that, you know, the bond was there before, but it was even like a hundred times stronger once we got to meet each other in person, like our energies kind of connected right then and there. And I, I feel it's very important, you know, for, for us to really pick and choose who our who's going to be part of our community, because they always say too, if, if, if the people around you aren't as good as you or better, they shouldn't be in your circle because we become who our environment is. So if we have people in our, in our environment that are, um, they have negative, you know, thoughts and actions and they're not doing well and they don't intend to do well and they have no ambition and no one's steering them on the right way. It's not your job to, you know, try to get them to, you know, to change, you know, they have to want to change, you know, um, but, you know, you can pick and choose the people around you that will inspire you and help you grow and you can support each other. You can create groups and you can create, you know, support within one another. So you all can, you know, grow as a community and thrive. Yeah, that's something that I see often in working with kids, uh, with teens, especially um, because, you know, those teenage years, development is all about separating from the family and creating their own groups. Um, yeah. And that's where we see a lot of um, kind of back and forth with parents and kids because the parents are like, "Ooh, I don't know about that group, but then also wondering yeah. how much am I allowed to um, set those limits. How far do I push before they push back too hard? And yeah. so as with most things um, that we've talked about with children, I start early. I would recommend starting early. Talk to your kids about what it means to be a good friend. Um, yeah. Talk through times where the people they're surrounding themselves with um, leave them feeling um, exhausted. Leave them feeling like they gave but got nothing in return. And talk about how it's okay to have friends like that, but go into it knowing that you're the one who's giving and one, and ask yourself, is that friend going to give later? Are they just in a bad place or are they just the kind of person that kind of takes all and gives nothing? And is that the kind of friendship you want to have? Is that how you want to interact? Um, and, and you just start to have those conversations again early talking about how people interact, talking about how they feel after they've hung out with certain people. Um, you know, you leave from a dinner party or from a hangout. Hey, I noticed you were kind of sitting off to the side. What was going on? Or, hey, it seemed like you were having a lot of fun. What was it about those kids that made that day so fun? And really, again, making it explicit. A lot of this learning happens implicitly. It's social learning theory. We learn from what, what's modeled around us. Um, and it doesn't mean your kid's not getting that, but if you talk about it explicitly, the next time they interact with somebody, they have that in the back of their mind. And they're thinking, 
does this person make me feel good? Do I enjoy being around this person? And you might yeah. save them from some of the heartache that comes in middle school and high school when friend groups shuffle and shift and all of that. They might be able to catch those more toxic friendships earlier or stay away from them completely. Um, yeah. And then uh, like thinking about adults too, like my, my children, we live near my in-laws, but that's the only family that's close to us. Um, and it's important for kids to have adults around them. I, again, we move so far away from what our brains and bodies are made for, which is that there's a community center. There's, there's all the families come together. The village watches the child, those kinds of things. So children benefit from having adults that aren't their parents. In fact, um, adults can serve as earned attachment figures for children. So when a child's not getting what they need from their parent, or they don't feel comfortable talking to their parents about X, Y, Z, they used to go to the cool aunt or the cool uncle um, or the older cousin, but we don't always have them around us anymore. So yeah. we need to ensure that our kids have those adults that are accessible, that are safe, that they can go to and they know they're not going to um, call mom and dad right away and share everything yes. they said. But as a parent, I know if there was a red flag that that adult would have told me. Yes, 100 percent. I think it's really important because I think, you know, what I've noticed, too, is that um the, the biggest problem I find is that, you know, when I when my kids were going through school, a lot of the parents um never changed their personalities they never matured they 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 had the same type of personality they had in high school because they never got into that leader mode they were always the follower so they always you know they carry those characteristics into their adult years and even some of the maybe you know not so good characteristics where they either gossiped about somebody or they like you said they kind of like you know take 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 but they don't give 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 and then the children will see that and then the children will exemplify the same behaviors and then they are bringing it to our children. And, you know, when I, after I, you know, had gotten older and I graduated and I had changed, you know, I grew up, I thought everybody grows up. And then I went back to taking my kids back to school. And then I realized that I was surrounded by a lot of high school mothers, you know, that, that just had the mentality of high school all over again. And it kind of shocked me in a sense. And it was, you know, but it's like, you know, how do we break that habit? You know, if, if someone is used to their own behaviors, they don't see it in themselves. And then they're teaching their children, you know, it, this is a problem. But, you know, is there a solution? Is there anything that we can do? Do we make our kids aware of it? You know, like you mentioned, you know, what are some of the things that we could do to to kind of break the barrier? So maybe if we, you know, if we can work on, you know, even parents maybe taking a look at themselves and saying, you know, being honest with themselves, you know, some of the things that I do, my kids are copying me. Is it really, you know, is it really good? Because I think honestly, we know if we really analyze ourselves honestly, we know where our flaws are, you know, but are we willing to change it? I can almost guarantee that anything that your child does that drives you crazy or that you don't like comes from you or your spouse or somebody that's in constant interaction with your children. And so honestly, that's a good place to start is what is it like when you get into an argument with your child and you're like, I can't stand when you do that. And then take that time again, that self-reflection time that we talk about a lot um, yeah. and, and ask yourself, what is it about this particular kiddo that, that is bothering me and where does it come from? And again, it, it likely comes from you. Um, and, and that's why we don't like it because it's a mirror of the things that we don't like about ourselves. Um, when it comes to you being on the outside and it's a, a parent who is modeling things for their child that you don't like, there's not a whole lot you can do to change somebody else's behavior. The only thing you can do is be purposeful about your own. And so it's those conversations with your children. Um, it's a, I like to model my thought process out loud for my kids. So it's, all right, we're going to hang out with so-and-so. You know, mommy doesn't really like when they do this or this. And so when they do that, I'm going to do this. And then I model for them how to navigate those relationships. And again, I was going to do that anyways, but I made it explicit so that they could see it and know to look at it. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's, using those real world experiences as learning tools for your child, which again, it's happening anyways, but doing it explicitly. 
Yes, I think that's great advice. You know, we can't change the people around us, but we could make them aware. We could make our children aware. We can make our, you know, we can teach our children not to do those certain things. And also like when we do get into those head to head arguments with our children, you know, maybe, you know, like look at ourselves more honestly, because, you know, I've had those head to heads and, you know, and, and my husband or something, you know, somebody will say, you know, she's just like you, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, and I guess that's where the, when we knocked heads, you know, a lot of times it was our similarities. It was, you know, the alpha dog coming out at the same time, you know, in certain subjects and stuff like that. But, you know, yeah, it definitely, you know, it, it starts with us, you know, but are we willing to look at our flaws and, and maybe change them and then have a, a good conversation with our child and, you know, and then, you know, when we're wrong too, you know, like we could look at ourselves and say, you know what, maybe I shouldn't have said that, or maybe I shouldn't have acted like that, or, you know, maybe I made the wrong choices, or when I do this, it's not such a great thing. And I really hate to see you, you know, do the same thing I did, because it didn't work for me, or something to that effect, I think, too, you know, that communic communication is key. And everything you're discussing right now, I think, revolves around that communication. Yeah, it does. Um, I can't count the number of times that a conversation has started with, it appears that neither of us did a very good job of controlling our emotions <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Mommy could have done this, this, and this. I'm wondering what you could have done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Definitely. Are there things that we could do together as a group, like the parent and the child that could actually, you know, help, you know, build the, the, the community, you know, build the relationship with your child and also so that they get to the point where they value your opinion. Because a lot of times kids, when you tell them to go left, they're going to go right at a certain age, you know, but, you know, if we can really, you know, have them see us as a role model, as a mentor, because like, as we were discussing before, a lot of times parents will try to be their friend instead of their parent, you know, and we need to be their mentor in, and they need to respect our, you know, respect us because if they respect us as a person, they're going to respect our, our advice and they're going to really, whether they like it or not, when we tell them it, that they're going to think about it because there's times where I have, you know, I have voiced my opinion and, and I didn't like something and they may not have agreed with me, but then later on I see them, you know, changing their, their way of doing things or doing it a little differently. So they did listen. They just, you know, and so I think it's important, you know, maybe you can go a little depth into that. Yeah. So first and foremost, um, is if we're expecting them to respect us and respect our opinion, engaging in that reciprocally goes a really long way. So if we show that we're willing to respect them and respect their opinions, mm -hmm. um, it makes it easier for them to hear what we have to say. And it doesn't mean we have to agree with them. I think we, we parents run into that where they're like, I can't respect it because I disagree with it. You can yeah. validate it. You can, you can understand where they're coming from without having to agree with where they're coming from. So just giving them space to feel and to say and to have you say, I hear you saying this. Or, um, for example, quickest way to get a toddler to stop throwing a temper tantrum. Oh, wow, you're really angry at mommy. And they're like, what? They don't know how to respond to that kind of validation and, and acknowledgement of how they're feeling. Um, so number one is, is have that mutual respect. Like you can't expect it if you're not willing to give it. Um, and then when it comes to doing things together, it's going to depend on you and your ability to manage your emotions. But if yeah. you can get yourselves, get, get the family, get you and one of your, your kids, whoever you're trying to build the relationship with, into a situation that requires some level of problem solving, some level of working together, um, and, you, and you're able to manage your emotions well enough that you're, you're, you're stable so that when they get frustrated or upset, you're able to work through it together. That's where I see the biggest growth coming. It's, it's the reason they do high ropes courses for executive development and things like that, because stressing the body in the brain to the point of, I don't know that I can do this. And then you are able to do it because you have the support of the other people really strengthens that relationship. Even something as simple as like game night, um, something as simple as this is what we do every Monday. Every Monday I take so-and-so to get sushi and it's just the time to have that conversation, but you're doing it consistently. Those yeah. kinds of things build that relationship, being fair, firm and consistent is like the best way to 
build a relationship with your child where they know that they can come to you because they already know what your response is going to be because it's been the same for the last four years. Right. And I like the idea of a healthy routine where you, you know, you do certain things, you know, consistently. And I think that also will help them also be more, you know, more routine oriented where they won't be scattered all over the board, but they in life, you know, it will, those type of characteristics will kind of rub off on them. And then in their life, they'll create routines and, you know, productive routines to help them move forward also. And then that kind of routine is big for that building of the community too. So if you, and, and that's where um, like church communities are so strong is you go every Wednesday and every Sunday and you see the same people and, and you know, those people care about you and you care about those people. And then you add into it that you share um, holidays and rituals and you share meals and those kinds of things matter. Um, you yeah. know, there's, there's that argument about quantity versus quality of time. And while you want to believe that if you have a couple good quality times, it counts, it yeah. does, but the quantity really does matter. Seeing somebody who shows up for you and loves you once a week for a short, for, you know, an hour once a week, they might not be taking you to Disney World or to do the fun things, but they're there all the time. That quantity and consistency, it, it matters in building um, that sense of, um, you can kind of build your sense of self in the shadow of the people who love you. And so when they're showing love for parts of you, those are the parts of you that you want to keep showing. Right, exactly. That's so important. I, I feel that, you know, it's, it's really important to have that, those powerful communities and you can get those powerful communities, even in the school, you can get it in after school programs, you can get it in sports, you can get it in church, you can get, you know, you could join things, you know, some people go to the pool club, they meet really nice people, they join, you know, they, they see the same kids there, you know, there's so many different ways to build, you know, relationships, positive relationships within the community. And I think it's just taking the time and the effort of, you know, realizing what's important and you know who do you want your kids around who do you want your kids becoming you know do you want to know who these kids are because a lot of times if they make friends within the community and you're part of that community you're going to know their friends you know you're not it's not going to be one of those things where they go out with a group of people and you don't know pretty much like 90 percent of the people who are there you might know one or two you know and like who are these other four or five people you know and you know that kind of leaves you up in the air and you just hope that your child you know everything you taught them you know they make their choices you know but it's better to know to be able to be on top of everything and to know all their friends and to really get a, a grasp on things like yeah. that and and again teenager adolescents it's normal to start to want to find your own community but what i've found is in working with adolescents the ones whose parents built a really strong community when they were young they would they would still go find their new community because they're adolescents and that's normal, but they would give up parts of that new community to stay with the old community. They're the ones that would say, yeah, you know, my friends are getting together that day, but that day is our game night, or that's the night that we go to dinner at this family's, or that's the night that the neighborhood does their thing. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do the family stuff and then I'll hang with my friends tomorrow or over the weekend. I like that idea. And I think that's very good because I think if we install community at a younger age, I know that for, you know, community was very big in our family. And, you know, when they got older, you know, they would drop things if, you know, we needed needed them for something or we needed, you know, we, we were doing something and they already had plans. They would drop their plans and, and, and help us. And, you know, or, or, you know, as long as they were, it didn't interfere with their work life, you know, they would be able to, you know, you know, help us or just join us for whatever event that we were doing and so forth. And they don't feel guilty about it. They don't feel guilt tripped by it. They want to be a part of the community because the community cared for them. So they yeah. care for the community. Yeah. And I'll use an example. Like my, my daughter, when she moved into college, she had to, she was on the second floor, the, no elevator. It was a walk up and she had to move all her furniture in. And, you know, she called her brother and he, you know, he dropped everything and he lived, you know, a distance from, from New York. And he was, he was more than willing to just spend the weekend going over there and helping her move in and, and get everything up there. So, you know, it's, I think when you do have a, a strong community, 
you know, people, you know, really value that. It's important. It really plays a, a strong role in a person's life. And I think when you get older in adulthood, you look back to these things. And if you don't have that community when you were a child, you kind of, there, there is a missing hole in, in, in your life, uh, in your heart. You, you, you can, it's not the same. It's, you know, you grow up trying to build that community as you get older and you're, you're building from scratch when you already should have had that foundation and that could cause problems too. And you don't know how, because you didn't see your parents doing it. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of how I grew up. Like, um, my dad worked nights, my mom worked really long days. I took care of my siblings. Um, and we lived on this like dead end dirt road. And so we had like a couple of neighbors that we talked to occasionally, but there wasn't that, that sense of, um, belonging that comes from yeah. having a community and belonging is a, is a core need of humans. And we got a little bit of it in like the church group and like some of the activities we did, but it was nothing that was um, fostered or maintained by my parents. It was when we went to church, we had it. When we had dance class, we had it, but it wasn't something that was like, and you know what, let's, let's have a cookout, let's do this. And so learning how to build a community was, was a, um, a pretty steep learning curve for me um, yeah. trying to figure out how to do it. And to be honest, it would have been way easier to just close myself in my house and turn on my TV and live in the yeah. community that was made for me on yeah. whatever series I was watching. But, but that didn't have that same feeling. I, I felt lonely. I felt like um, I didn't have anybody to talk to. I was young when I had kids. So I was the first one to have, to have children. I didn't have people to talk to about that experience and yeah. so I, I I did the work and it and it is it's harder work to build a community especially yes. from scratch than it is to just live life and get lost in the amenities and comforts of the 21st century yes a hundred percent you know I I think it's something that you know if you wanted to like um, really give people advice and you, you wanted to like give them a few steps on how to begin that community, you know, and within their own family so they can, you know, or improve the actual community. Because what I find too is I, I see, you know, they start off strong and then so many things come into the way, you know, you, kids are getting older, one kid's going here, one kid's going there, dad's working, mom's working, you know, and, and there's so many different things going on. And, you know, people get tired, so they don't have the energy, you know, that they did before. So a lot of the things they're letting slide and the community isn't, isn't as strong, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, what are some of the things we could do to strengthen community within our home and in our family? And, and how could we stay consistent so it grows and builds into a very strong bonded community within the family and within our outreach so we could have healthy, productive children, and we could be happy too as an adult also. Yeah. So within the family, it's, it's finding like making the time and I, I get it. I get the life is hectic. I, especially when your kids are in all different places, um, but pick a day, pick a hour that is yeah. together time that the tv's off the the phones are off and that you're actually engaging again i don't recommend just sitting around the table talking if you haven't if you haven't been doing that because that will be way uncomfortable um but take a family walk um play a game like movies aren't a bad thing but you're not interacting so it's not going to be as strong as some of the other things but if you haven't been doing family time movie time is a good way to start that process yeah. um, especially if you're like we're going to do movie time but let's make the popcorn together and let's buy the snacks together and so you're doing the the build up to the movie together um, really you're looking for ways to increase communication, increase face-to-face -face communication, um, because most parents, they talk to their kid on text message a couple of times a day, and then they might be like, go to bed or do your homework. And that's about the extent, just because of the nature of how busy everybody's lives are. And so it really is finding that time, making that time, being purposeful with that time, um, and that includes the parents. You can't tell your kids that they have to come engage and then be like, oh, sorry, I have an important work call. It, that, yeah. doesn't, that doesn't work because that's that, that's that lack of reciprocity of respect. 
um, where you expect them to respect the community, but you are not respecting the community. Um, with my kids, I like to let them have say in what we're doing. Um, for example, one of the things we've done, and this this talks about how we how we built the community outside. Our neighborhood is um, slowly turning over. Uh, it was mostly older families whose kids were off in college, and as they move out, new families come in with younger kids. So my kids are kind of um, on the higher age level of kids. Um, we started a haunted forest <laughs> three years ago for the neighborhood, and we just we sent a message out to the community. That our neighborhood is. Um, they don't do a lot together. It doesn't have like a pool or those kinds of things. It's just a, just a little neighborhood. Um, and so like we'd see people walking and like wave and say hi, but that's the extent of community building there was. And so the kids wanted to do a haunted forest. And so they created it with the neighbor kids that they hang out with. Um, and we sent an invite to the community, to the neighborhood, thinking maybe like three people would show up. We had 50 people in our driveway because everybody wants that sense of community, but nobody's engaging in the outreach or the setup of it. And now we're yeah. here on year three. My husband, my husband hates it. He doesn't want to, <laughs> do it. He doesn't want to talk. He doesn't, but, but it's going to be one of those core memories for the kids. And it, and it does. We have people passing us on the street. Hey, when's the haunted forest going to be? What's the theme going to be? And so it, for, that, for the outreach, it's just do it. Just do the outreach, host a cookout. Um, you hit it off with a friend's friend and you really enjoy talking with them at this like group get together or this wedding, get their contact information and actually send a message. And, right. and if they don't respond in a couple of weeks, send it again, because they probably were busy. Like, But to build a community, you have to lean into the uncomfortable and, and, and be the one that's making that first try. You have to be the one who's willing to say, I'm interested in continuing this relationship. Would you be a part of it? And, yeah. and be okay with if they say, if they don't respond, they don't respond and they might not have been as interested or they might be too busy. Um, but the only way to really build community is to kind of put your neck out on the line and try. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I think, I think it's so important to do things like that. And I think the kids remember it, you know, like the, the kids, and I think it, it, it makes them more family oriented too. So when, when they have their children or if they have their family, if they do, you know, th these are things they're going to want to bring into their, into their kids' lives, you know? So it's, it's, it's a great thing to do. Like anything that we've done, you know, cause we, we did a lot of family events you know, it, it really was special and the kids really enjoyed it. You know, um, when that, as they got older, it wore off a little, but then they enjoyed watching the little ones, you know, like their little cousins doing it, you know, it brought enjoyment to them. So it was always, you know, it always was a, a it's, it's a great thing if you can keep it up and keep doing it because it is a lot of work to do, but it does, it does benefit the child or the young adult or the teenager in many ways. Yeah, it's that power of rituals. Um, a group of people coming together doing the same thing for the same reason They're, it's powerful that's why every religion you can you can think of has rituals built into it every um every political thing you know meetings have rituals and and yeah it keeps things like they're supposed to be but it, it's it's built upon the back of people coming together and doing things for the same purpose and and yes. that, that's how that's how communities heal is through ritual. Like, you know, the, the individuals in Western North Carolina, we can, they can call and do like, there, there are a lot of people offering free therapy services, which is great. So they can call and do their free therapy service for, for an hour a week, but the power of coming together with others and singing a song in church or sharing a meal together or working together to, to clear a road, those kinds of shared bonding, we're doing it because we all have it, have, um, have skin in the game. We all care. We all have this shared purpose. That, yeah. that can, the power of a shared purpose cannot be understated. Yes. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Now, if we had to take everything that we talked about today in today's discussion, what are some important things you really like to emphasize to the listeners today? I think that first of all, the power of, of community for not only healing, but also for that sense of belonging, um, which gives you that lifelong contentment is huge. And then secondary, 
that creating community requires you to do some work and to be um, consistent in that work. Um, and then thirdly, and this one is less about community, but it, they keep we keep on touching on it. Um, and that's the explicitly teaching your kids the social emotional pieces and parts um, is um, goes a lot further than expecting them to just pick it up from watching. Right, exactly. I like that a lot. Now, can you tell people about the different services that you provide? Yeah. So through um, my private practice, Apoclar Ponders, which is at apoclarponders.org, I provide parent consultation, psychological assessment, um, just kind of a one-on-one -on -one conversation about my kids doing this, what do I do? Or I want to build a community, where do I start? Those kinds of things. Um, there's also a lot of free resources there. And then the nonprofit that I've been talking about is uh, it's called Sentinel Foundation. Its website is backwards, foundationsentinel.org. Um, and it addresses child sex trafficking and sexual exploitation, but also has a humanitarian crisis side because so much of the sexual exploitation arises from within these humanitarian crisis spaces. Um, and so you can go to the website. There's a, a banner across the top right now for how to help with the hurricane relief. But we also, like I said, do um, rescues of kids who are in uh, exploitative situations as well as prevention efforts through educating parents and children and uh, teachers and aftercare services, similar to what I offer personally, um, but they're free because they're paid for through donors if you've experienced those kinds of trauma experiences. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, is, on your website, are there any um, like newsletters they can sign up for or do you have any free downloads or anything that you offer or free assessments and so forth? So there are free downloads on the APO Claire Ponders website, uh, things about how to talk to your children after crises, um, how to work through grief with your child, those kinds of things. Um, I try to keep a blog. I'm not as good at it as I should be, but when new ones come in, you can sign up to get an email notification that there's a new blog coming in. Um, that tends to be more just my ramblings as I navigate parenting myself. Um, nice. So there are some curse words in there, just a heads up. Um, but uh, there are several free services um, through that website. Oh, I love it. Well, this has been amazing, Ashley. You you know, you always come on, you, you hit such great topics. And I think today is, is a very important topic. You know, it's really, you know, keeping in, in contact, with, you know, have a good relationship with our child and really, you know, creating that positive community and, and staying consistent with it. And I, I think that's so important. I think sometimes because the world is such a busy place and because we're always doing, doing, we sometimes lose track, but then we have to really think about, you know, what's most important in our life. And and, you know, what are the things that mean the most to us? And, you know, everything we do is going to affect our children or, you know, at any stage of their, of their you know, life cycle. So we really have to, you know, really think about, you know, how we react to things, how we do things, how, you know, what kind of environment are we giving our children? Even when our children become adults, you know, are we there for them? Are we, you know, are we giving them good advice or guidance? You know, if they need help, are we providing that help for them? You know, it never ends, you know, and this is something that we should really keep in our mind and 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 really try to you know reevaluate on a frequent basis to make sure that we're keeping up with our expectations because sometimes we might have great expectations but we let them slip away and mm -hmm. you know because of life itself not because we do it intentionally so i think it's something that we always have to really keep on top of so i'm really happy you brought this topic up today and i think it, it will really you know really make people really reevaluate themselves and understand you know what they need to do for themselves and for their families to gr grow that powerful community within so they can you know have a constructive and happy you know family life and and future for their children so thank yeah. you yeah, one of the ways that I keep all that in mind, and it might be helpful for, for you all, is I try to keep at the forefront of my mind, what do I want my, my children to be like as adults? And is what I'm doing in my day-to-day -day building people that are going to become that? Or am I modeling or showing something different? Because I can say family is important, but if I don't act like family is important, it doesn't mean anything. Exactly. 100%. 100%. Thank you so much, Ashley. This has been amazing. And everybody, if you have any questions, I encourage you to go to her website 
and you know visit her, ask her questions. You can send them to our our site, and we will send them and forward them to her. But Ashley has such great advice, and she has covered so many different topics that I think it's well worth the visit, and it's well worth you know contacting Ashley for guidance, support, information, questions because parenting is a very important job, and we do our best, but there is no guide out there to you know step by step guide. So we need all the help and support that power community which Ashley provides. So take a look at her website, take a look at you know, everything that she provides and, and contact her. Thank you so much, Ashley. This has been a wonderful experience. Thank you.